All right. Um, my name is James McBride, um, and I am calling. I am talking to you from uh, my my living room in uh, Lamaville, New Jersey. Uh, I'm sitting in my. The living room contains my piano, a lot of my music paraphernalia. Next to this room is my writing room, which contains my typewriter and computer and all that jazz. Um, I move from one room to the next during the course of my day when I write. I write and then I come here and play a little bit or play my saxophone a little bit, then I go back and write. Um, my new book is called Deacon King Kong and it's, uh, it's, about a, um, it's about a community in Brooklyn that was inspired by Red Hook housing projects where I was born and uh, where I still work. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's about a deacon who, an old deacon from the church who, uh, who drinks, you know, joy juice to be happy. And he gets really tagged one day. He just gets blasted and uh, picks up his old uh, pea shooter and goes out into the plaza and shoots the worst housing, the worst uh, drug dealer in the housing projects. He doesn't, he doesn't kill him, but he shoots him. In. And the, the sh this, this shooting sets off a wave of activity that allows us to see the church, the neighborhood, the people, the environment of Brooklyn, New York in, um, in 1969, when this book takes place. So I, I wrote it because it's a neighborhood that I really love. It's a community that I really love and still, and, and that was part of my life and, and remains in my spirit. And, uh, and that I still have a lot of uh, connectivity to. My parents started a church in Brooklyn, a small storefront church, not a storefront church, but a tiny church. And that church still exists. Uh, it's, it's in the Red Hook Projects in uh, South Brooklyn. So I wanted to create a world that, that most people only see from behind the wheel of a tightly locked car. And to let people see how, to let the wider world see how people in the projects live. I recently read about Donald Hall, who died, the poet. And he lived in, I think it was, it was a small town in New Hampshire. And... You know, I even though his community was extremely different from the one that I grew up in and that I still <clears throat> am part of, there are enormous similarities, and I'm trying to sh I try to show those similarities so that my community isn't seen as sort of kind of a stereotypical place where people get shot and they always you know they want tennis shoes and listen to hip hop music all the time and everyone play, you know wants to play basketball and all this other stereotypical stuff which is just not the people it's not the community it's not the people that i know so that's really that was how this book was you know it's the, that's the reasoning behind deacon king Kong. and i wanted to make it funny because my community is a funny place and you know uh black people know how to laugh we we we, we do that um very well probably too much and that's not to say other groups don't know how to laugh um jewish people are very funny Irish people, you know, crack me up. I mean, but I just wanted to show what this community looks like. And in addition, this book is not just about African Americans. It has several major characters who are who are white, Italian, Irish, and so forth. It's because Brooklyn back then was a a mixed community, um, like it is now, but in a different way. So that that's really the the, the premise of this book. It should be. It was meant to be a joyful ride to see how people have learned to cope and to live, to be happy. Well, there's no certainty to life when you're an African-American in this country. Um, because the problem, the race problem is not black people. The race problem really emanates from the fact that, you know, the moment, from the moment you're born when you're African-American, your politics and your social sociology, your social standing is written in the color of your face. So you've learned, you have to learn how to cope with that piece of business. <clears throat> and some of us have learned to do it better than others. But it's the coping, that's where the story is. I mean, the, the coping is the joy and the joy is the journey. And when you, when you write books or poems or anything, um, you want to take the reader or the, the, the viewer or the, the art appreciator on a kind of journey that allows them to see 
that we can do this. I mean, you know, everybody knows that this country is being dismantled by, you know, a group of criminals. Um, but yet we, we manage and we will manage to, to overcome it because that's, that's who we are. That's part of what makes America special. Characters are everything. They feed the whole business. I mean, you see this room here. This room is full of paintings and junk and paraphernalia of my life. But it doesn't mean anything if, if there's no one here to see it or enjoy it or, or share it. Um, life, is not, life is worthless without... What's the point of having something if you can't share it with somebody? So when you create characters you're allowing people who you'd like to meet into your space that they might give you some understanding as to who they are. And then you, your job is to share that with a reader in a way that allows you to see the, the, the humanity and kindness and goodness of that character. I've just always loved to play music. I, I don't love to record it and I hate to rehearse. And I don't like a lot of the stuff that music involves, you know, professional music involves, because a lot of it's just, it's, a, it's just, you just have to love music. I don't love music enough to, to go on the road for six months. And, you know, not that people do that anymore now, but even as a young man, I didn't love it enough to practice, you know, after school, I didn't love it enough to practice for four or five hours a day, like some of these cats, some of these men and women. Writing, on the other hand, uh, was easy because you could just sit there and think, you know, and, you know, bing, you know, good things happen. Well, you know, it was a way of making a living when I was younger. You know, I worked at the Washington Post and I worked at Boston Globe and um, I covered Michael Jackson for, you know, for almost, I guess it was, it must have been eight or nine months when he was, uh, when he was hot, like when he was big. Um, but the process of, of writing and creating characters. Some of that comes from the, the business of learning how music works because music requires a certain technical knowledge that you, you just have to be able to understand in order for melody to grow. So here's a crude example of me. That's just that, that's the song everybody knows. Well, that comes from your ability to know that this note can be played, you know, this way, or this way, or this way, or this way. So you're dressing up this character with this, with these other characters. And that, that, that's sort of, that comes from just the technical knowledge that jazz harmony and jazz arranging and the knowledge of jazz that, you know, that I acquired from my years of playing and, you know, studying at Oakland Conservatory and so forth. Um, so with writing, you have the same business. You have that. And then this, you know, this character is going to do something. And what he's going to do determines the flow of your plot. Because your plot is based on the, the, the push and pull of good and evil within that character or set of characters. Now, my job is to make sure that that this character moves toward the common commonality of the human experience. And so I'm, I'm restricted in the sense that I, I, I can't create characters that simply pull out a pistol and shoot the guy and then jump out the window and shoot somebody else. And then they, you know, they have guns to each other's heads. And I mean, I can't, I can't do that. There's a reason if there's a reason or, or a causality behind it, then the exploration of that reason is the story. So in Deacon King Kong, for example, it happens to begin with an act of violence. But then the book stretches on for, you know, 250 pages, you know, working around that one act to show the reader why, uh, why this happened. 
Culturally, American ingenuity is is deeply rooted in African American music, uh, and not just jazz. I mean, gospel I've always felt because I grew up in the church. Uh, gospel I've always felt is a music that is rarely studied, rarely understood, um, misused, and and co opted for everyone's purpose without people really understanding the the technical ingenuity behind it. There's a lady named Bernice Reagan who lives in Washington, D.C., who's just an extraordinary musician, who's done that, done some fantastic work with the Smithsonian. And readers would be wise to catch up to Miss Reagan before she exits this. I don't know how old she is, but she's not, you know, she's not 25. But and um, one of the things that she and others of her of her type have come to understand based on their own being raised in the church like I have been is that the, just the technical ingenuity of gospel music is something that is very, very rarely studied and very rarely understood. For example, this is just like when you're in church and the, you know, the minister saying, yes, well, you know, and stay, stay well and everyone, we're gonna pray for everyone, you know. These, this, this progression, it's called secondary dominance, I believe. And um, it's something that you you just won't hear this in Italy. Um, you, the, the the movement of the move the, the the technical movement of the harm, the harmonic approach of music that came out of gospel in the late forties and early fifties is really the basis for an enormous amount of of fantastically rich music, and and most of all pop music and jazz as well. I mean, it's, it's just that it's. It all comes from the same tree. You learn that there are certain things that you just have to work around. It's just called living. And you learn the, to work around the things that are difficult and to find solutions that work so that so things can keep functioning because there is no justice for so many people in this country. People without money, people without jobs and so forth. And not all of them are black people. And some of the people who deliver injustice are not white, some of them are black. So you learn that there are certain battles to fight and there are certain things you just leave alone. And that kind of reason, that kind of like standing back and doing just what you can do within your own framework uh, is part of the, the culture, I think, of a good, of a good church. Um, I'm not talking about these super duper churches where they pass around five gallon buckets, you know, and <laughs> you know, ream these poor people for their last penny. But I'm talking about a, a really good church that you just learn to say, this is what we can do. We do what we can do. And, um, and you know, it, it, that's really, that's really how it works. Um, you don't, you don't make a committee. You, you actually just go ahead and do, do what you can do. And uh, and try and try to just ig ignore the persons around you who are doing whatever they're doing, because in the long run, you know, it's your ledger that that has to be weighed against, you know, when you make that your final journey. My job is to find out how people talk. That's what I get paid to do. So I'm always listening to what people have to say. I tell my students. Um, at NYU, I say the, the, the best expression you can have when you're talking to someone is to say, is that right? Is that right? Because even if you think you know, you really don't. And oftentimes, how you say things are more important than what you say. So um, with characters, look, if John Brown uh, is going, you know, would, would speak about you know, he wants this room cleared out right now. John Brown himself, whose picture you see behind me, if John Brown walked into this room and I was a slave owner and he said, you know, I want to take your slaves right now, he wouldn't even say that. He'd say, I'm going to free every Negro in this room right now. I'm going to take all these children of God with me. And unless I had a shotgun in my pocket, I would say, OK, Mr. Brown, you know, I'm losing a lot of money when you take, quote unquote, my people. But you go right ahead because I know John Brown is the type to pull out his pistol and drop the hammer on it and tell the hammer to hurry into place as fast as possible. So I wouldn't. So 
how, how he says it and who he is are a blend of that character. Um, in Deacon King, King Kong, the principal character is an old, an old guy from the South who came to New York, and he still talks like he's from the South. So he has that sort of, that rich tapestry of Southern, of Southern uh, twang and Southern dialogue that is just so rich and so, so, so straight and perfect. So, so direct that you'd be doing a him or her a disservice by not um, allowing that language to show itself. So I, I, I tend to rewrite dialogue all the time until it's really fits to, you know, to what the character's saying, to who the character is. You know, you have to get to it. You have to get to it. You have to, you know, state the melody and let the reader know why you're there because we have, we don't have the attention span we, we, we once had. I mean, I read somewhere recently that the average 65 year old person spends 12 years of uninterrupted time in front of a television set. Now that's just, I mean, you, you can go all through this house. You won't find one TV set. I mean, I, I, you know, life is short enough as it is. Why am I going to sit there? You know what you look like when you're watching TV, you look like this. I mean, you know, somebody's just pumping stuff into your head. <laughs> I mean, uh, I'd rather sit at home, eat bananas than just like, you know, look at some. My point is that we have to learn to listen. And I think we've forgotten to learn. We've forgotten how to do that. And it's hurting us because we, we don't even listen to each other. Oh, I, I have a lot of hope. I'm so proud of what has just happened with these kids, these young people running around here with the Black Lives Matter movement. I can't tell you how proud it's made me feel. It's given me enormous hope. Um, I think we have a, I think our future is a lot brighter than we, than we know right now. It's, it's always darkest before the dawn. We've suffered tremendously these past three and a half years, but um, these recent events with, you know, with the, the tragic death of George Floyd and so many others has inspired these young people who are, who have burst out of what I thought was the cynical cloud that covered their entire their entire um, generation because because of, you know because they have computers and they have the internet and they can look at stuff and they you know they they think they know stuff because they Google it and so forth. But to get up out of your house and march in the street, um, to to stand up and actually be counted on the, in in the business of race, um, it has really inspired me in terms of watching these. It inspired me to see these kids. Look, I come from a generation where. When I sat down, as a young man, when I sat down to talk about race problems with white people in school or wherever, it was always like 10 black people and three white people. It should have been the other way around. So now it looks like it's the other way around. And that means that real change, I believe, is possible and it's coming. And it doesn't have to be in a figurehead. It's not one person doing it. It's a swelling of moral righteousness that has that has been that has been lit. It's a fire. And that's not easy to put out. Think about it. If you're 18 years old, you're not going to forget the time you were marching, you know, in Washington, D.C. and they tear gassed you. You won't forget it. You ought to, I mean, Donald Hall talks about, you know, the late Donald Hall in his book about essays over 80 talks about how when him and his son went to Washington, D.C. to protest the war in Vietnam in 1969. What a gifted man he was. Poets is, man, poets are like dinosaurs, man. They walk alone. You know, he was one of those. And, um, you know, um, no, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not pessimistic about the future at all. I, I'm very, I'm very excited that I hope God lets me see what will happen next because I, I'm very excited about what these young people are doing now. They're going way further than we went. We, we left them with a pile of dung and they're, they're turning it into magic dust. You'll see. Well, if I could speak to them, I'd say, you know, I'm sorry that we didn't do the job that you're doing now. Uh, don't get hurt. Keep doing it. Just keep doing it until you can't do it no more. But don't get hurt. And take good notes, you know, with a pen and a paper. 
because there's nothing like looking back in the cone of memory to tell you what happened. Anyone can, you know, make a videotape and that's important in many instances. But the fabric and the, the, the labyrinth of memory carries so many different vitamins and minerals. And so as you pass through it, so much, you, you'll grow so much stronger if you have the memory itself to power you in, in the coming years. Because there are some difficult days ahead. But I say to them, we are, we are so proud of you. Just don't get hurt. And uh, keep peace in your heart and keep the struggle, you know, struggle on with, struggle on with. We're watching. And we're inspired.